Hey, thanks for joining us online at the Assembly. We believe in biblical teaching and preaching, and this message is designed to proclaim the hope of Jesus. So be sure to share it with a friend or on your social media. We would love to stay connected as well, so be sure to follow our channel. We hope this message encourages you. In fact, here in a moment, we're going to read our passages of Scripture, verses of Scripture that we're going to be looking at today. And uh, you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to two passages of Scripture. Acts chapter 2, we'll start there, and then we'll go to 1 Peter chapter 1. So Acts chapter 2, we're going to be beginning at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and then we're going to jump over to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. And so I want you to bring your Bibles with you. I love paper Bibles because that way you can take notes, you can underline, you can highlight. I know that you can do that with your digital Bible, uh, but, but I encourage you to bring uh, your paper uh, Bible with you. If, you. if you prefer the digital, that's fine. Uh, we just, I just think that it's, it's good to have that because the Holy Spirit may trigger a thought in you as I'm sharing and you want to take a note to go back and, uh, and, and study a little bit deeper. And so we're in class every Sunday morning here at the assembly. We want to learn the, God, the Word of God, but not just learn the Word of God, but we uh, saw a couple of weeks ago, it's proclamation, preaching the Word, application, putting it to work in my life, and that's when we get what? Transformation. Man, I'm glad my wife said that. She's the only one that got the answer right. <laughs> And so the the Bible teaching is very, very important to us. And so today we're going to hear the Word of God, and then we're going to apply it to our life, and that's when transformation can take place. So um, it's really interesting because we're in this series called Living Fit, and we've, we've looked at the different disciplines and devotions of the early church. And, and today we're going to look at connecting, connecting to the church. Why is it important to be at church? Why is it important for, uh, for corporate worship? Uh, there's a little boy, it was his first time that his dad had taken him to church. He was getting a little older and his dad said, you know, I probably need to raise my, my son in church. I want him to have a good scriptural foundation. I haven't been taking him to church. And so the first Sunday, the little boy was a little bit skittish about going to children's church. So he sat with his dad and the ushers came by during the service as they were going to receive the offering. And the little five-year-old boy who had never been in church before looked at his dad. He said, dad, it's okay. You don't have to pay for me. I'm only five. And I think sometimes we forget people who aren't connected to church and don't attend church, the things that we do may seem a little odd, or they may not understand why we go to church and what we do, the reasons why we do what we do. And so today, that's what I want us to look at is why is it important to connect to a church? Every Sunday morning, we're not the only church that's gathering I know that we have a campus in Gentry, and so we, we, we are here looking at the Word and worshiping together. They're doing that also in Gentry, but across the nation, there's a little over 100 million people that are worshiping this morning. We're not alone. <laughs> We're not alone. That's not, that, that is Christian worship. That's not anything else. That's just 100 million people across this nation. So, so there is this, this desire to be in church. Now, we have seen a decline in church attendance, and especially, uh, of course, during the pandemic, but even, even now when, when people are getting back into whatever routine their new routine is. In fact, from um, the Institute of Family uh, Studies made this study, and since the pandemic, not 2020, but this ha- actually happened in 2021, uh, there's a downturn of church attendance from 34% to 28 percent 34 percent basically a third of of christians in america would attend church and since the pandemic that has even dropped and there's a lot of different speculations and a lot of different reasons we we speculate and we even come up with some type of reason for even people here at the assembly not returning after the pandemic for whatever purpose and so there's about a third of the u.s population that attends church And another study out of this same uh, institute shows that the faithful, people who consider themselves faithful church attenders, attend 1.2 times a month. Now, I don't know where the point two comes from. Maybe maybe the preacher said something they didn't like and they left in the middle of the sermon. I I don't know. But think of, I want that to soak in and sink in. The faithful, they consider themselves faithful 
to church attendance. And they only attend maybe one, just a little bit more than one time a month. And I can show you, according to our statistics and our data here at the assembly, it's pretty spot on. It may be a little bit more here in the buckle of the Bible belt, but even here in our region, in our community, it's pretty close. And I, I think that there's a lot of reasons why, but I don't want to look at the reasons why people don't go to corporate worship. I want us to focus on why it's so important to be part of corporate worship. Because I believe if I know the why, that will result in me going and making a change. And so that's what I want to do this morning, is I want to encourage you to know why we come together on Sundays and, and, and even Saturday night, some church, it, it doesn't matter when, but you come together in corporate worship. I believe one reason is, is what we see in Scripture, the model that's given to us in the early church. Now this is where uh, each, each week, before we read our passage of Scripture, we stand together to honor the reading of God's word before I preach and teach. So would you mind all across this worship center, would you mind to stand? And even if you're at home, if you're able to, to stand as we read these passages of scripture this morning. Over the past few weeks, we have, um, I have intentionally, I haven't brought it out intentionally, but we have been covering spiritual disciplines to live fit. And I've actually taken them out of the first century church, after the day of Pentecost and, and, and the early church forming, they were pretty successful. They saw 3,000 people saved and they saw signs, wonders, and miracles take place. How many would like to be a part of that church? Well, I thought, you know, um, let's look at what they did. And so in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 43, over the past few weeks, you can connect the dots and see. We talked about prayer. We talked about uh, teaching and, and applying it to our life. And today we're going to talk about connecting and worship. And so verse 42 of Acts 2 says this. They devoted themselves. They devoted. That's, that's, that's such a powerful word. More powerful in the Greek than it is in the English. But they devoted themselves, look at this, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Now, this isn't in your notes, but if you, if you skip down to verse 46, the New Living Translation says this, they worshiped together at the temple. They worshiped together at the temple. They worshiped together at the temple. Can you say it with me? They worship together at the temple. So I'm not saying that if you do all these things, poof, everything's going to be great. I'm just saying that this is a model that we need to continue to follow, devoting ourselves to the preaching and teaching of God's Word, devoting ourselves to fellowship, devoting ourselves to communion around the Lord's table. We do that every month. Also devoting ourselves to prayer. But they also devoted themselves and made sure that they came to the temple and they worshiped together. And something takes place when we give our heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see what takes place in 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read out of the Living Bible, paraphrase. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. All honor to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it is His boundless mercy that has given us the privilege, the privilege of being born again, look at this, so that we are now members of God's own family. It's our privilege to be part of God's family. And I never want to take that privilege for granted. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, I declare my dependence upon you. I pray that um, I will just share the words that are from your throne room of grace and that as we hear the Word of God today, we will apply the Word of God today, and the Word of God will transform our lives. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The Bible says that when we become a believer in Jesus Christ, that we become a member of God's family. Now, just, just think about it just a moment. When you were born and you came into this world, you were born into a physical family, the human race, a certain family. When we accept Jesus Christ, what we just read in 1 Peter, 
when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we are born into his family. When we have this new beginning spiritually, we become part of God's family. And it's interesting because you can look at the church as the family of God. In fact, the Bible teaches us that we as believers, we together form the body of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that the family is called the church. And now I, I want to differentiate and I want you to hear my heart. The church is the people, but there's also a terminology we use as the church as a building for a place for us to come to worship Jesus. So we use those words interchangeably. Well, I'm going to go to the church because we have a Bible study. Or I'm going to go to church and drop, drop off chocolate chip cookies to Pastor Gary. Or I'm, going to, <laughs> or I'm going to go to church and drop an apple off to Pastor Gary. He's caned a couple of pounds. I don't need cookies. He needs fruit. And uh, that's fine. That's okay. Uh, I like honey crisp apples if anybody wants to, you know, help me with my diet. But... <laughs> But you use those words interchangeably because we also know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But just because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, we are the church as believers in Jesus Christ does not negate us coming together in a certain place called the church as a family of God for corporate worship. And we're going to see why it's important for us to gather together as believers in Christ for corporate worship. It's interesting to me that the church, it's not an institution, although it can be formed like an institution. It's not a business, even though we do have business that we have to take care of. There's a business side of the church. It's not an organization, even though we have organized discipleship and organized programs and ministries that are taking place. But what I want us to see today is the church is the body of Christ. And in your life, you're going to have some things that you're going to go through. And you need, you need a good support system to help you go through those things. Because the church is where we find support and foundation of truth. That's in your notes. The church is where we find support and the foundation of truth. Now, you need to make sure that where you attend church, the scripture is being taught correctly. Because today, just because it's a church, and even though it's labeled a Christian church, the Word of God is sometimes not divided correctly. So you need to know, you need to know, <laughs> and there's times that I make mistakes, but you need to know that when you come to church, that this service, this corporate worship, it has been planned, it has been prayed for, and we have done our best to know and feel what God's direction is for, our, our, for the body of Christ. And so therefore, we don't, we don't shy away from what the Word of God says about sin. We don't shy away about what the Word of God says about discipleship. We don't shy away from, you know what, if, if you're living a life of sin, we're, gonna, we're going to share in love. You know what, that's not scriptural. Well, you know, don't judge me unless you want to be judged. Whoa, 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 don't take scripture out of context either. You know, so the teaching of God's word is what we want to be the foundation of your life. And I know that you can get great biblical teaching off, off the media, and I understand that. But there's something about coming together and supporting one another when we have the foundation of truth in our life. And see, the Christian life is not just believing. The Christian life is also belonging. We belong to the family of God. It's not just enough for me to believe in Jesus Christ. I need to understand because I do believe in Jesus Christ, I belong to a family. Now, let me just take a quick poll. How many have family members that everybody knows they're a little different? You're probably sitting beside someone and you're not raising your hand. Well, it's the same in the church. How many's ran across a believer, a brother or sister in the Lord? They're just a little different. They ordered a Happy Meal, and a few fries got left out. <laughs> I mean, they're just different. That doesn't mean we don't love them. We love them, but we need to teach them. They need to feel like not only that they believe in Christ Jesus, but they belong to the family. It's connecting. It's community. It's belonging to a family. Some people say, well, I'll be a Christian, but I don't need the church. Well, that's like saying, I'm going to play football in the NFL, but I don't need a team. I mean, you can't do that. Now, let me, let me put a disclaimer before I get emails and, and letters that are not signed. By the way, if you send me a letter and it's not signed, I don't read it. 
That's cowardly. Okay, let's sit down and reason together. We may not agree, but we can agree to disagree, and we'll just move on. And so, so anyway, let me, I just want to share that. I, I want to, because <laughs> that has happened. I'm not talking about people who cannot attend church because of sickness, because of situations when it comes to health or even work. I'm talking about people who intentionally stay out of being connected to the local church. We saw that before the pandemic, and then when everything shut down, we went online and we really ramped up our online presence, not just us, but every church. But some people got comfortable sitting at home in their pajamas and drinking their cup of java and watching and trying to worship corporately when they're in their living room by themselves. And you cannot do that. Everybody's watching online. We just lost a whole lot of people watching online. <laughs> Listen to me. Hear your pastor's heart. I know that there are times when you cannot be here. I understand that. But I don't view, I don't personally see online being a campus. I see it as being an option. When I can't be with my brothers and sisters in Christ worshiping, I can't be there, but I can still stay connected. If I'm out of town, if I've worked, I can go back and watch. I understand that there are situations due to health and work that people cannot, because we have one Sunday service at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. I know in our culture that that doesn't fit, and used to, you couldn't buy a car on Sundays, you couldn't get a loaf of bread on Sundays, because everything shut down. How many remember the days where after church on Sunday morning, you didn't say, hey, where do you want to go? Eat because nothing was open because everything was closed you went home and ate roast and potatoes and then whatever was left over you ate the rest of the week but that's not the culture in, in, that we live in so I understand people have to worry people but when when you are able to be part of the family worshiping together be there just just be there you're, you're missing out on something and so it's connecting, it's community, it's belonging to a family. And if you, don't, if you don't have the support, you don't have the foundation that you can find at the local church, then you may not make it in the future. You may make bad choices, you may make bad decisions. And so why did God design church? Why did he design us to come together as his family to worship him? Well, I believe it's for his glory and for our benefit. It's for his glory and for our benefit. I benefit every time I'm around other believers. I hear something, I'm encouraged. Or what they share with me drives me to my knees to pray for them. And anytime you're praying to God, something's gonna take place. Something's gonna take place. So there's several purposes to be connected to the church and the church fulfills. I'm gonna go through these this morning and um, once again, if, if you, if you want to do a deeper study or if you don't want to take notes this morning or if you miss a blank, email me. I'll send my notes to you. They're not copyrighted at all, but I, use them as a study guide, however you can use them. But first, we need to understand that connecting to the local church helps me feel God's presence through corporate worship. It helps me feel God's presence through corporate worship. Do you ever get distracted? You know, this year we're talking about being refocused. We all have distractions. In fact, just, just the other day, I, I was thinking about, okay, I need to get refocused. What, what are things that, that, that are distracting me? And there's a lot of things that can distract you. It can be politics, it can be media, it can be a, a hobby, it can be situations at work. There's a lot of things that can bring distraction. And I believe that God knows that we tend to lose focus. And one way that he'll, he helps us to gain focus again is he tells us in scripture that the sabbath is very important the sabbath is very important in fact in the ten commandments we are told and instructed to keep the sabbath holy we don't hear a lot of teaching on the sabbath today because we live in a 24 7 society that was never god's plan it was never God's plan. I'm learning this. It's something that I haven't practiced before, but I'm trying to get better at it. And I'm not perfect at it at all. When I do get perfect at it, I'll teach it. <laughs> I'm just not good at it. And Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13 and 14 says, keep the Sabbath day holy. And I want you to hear this. And I want you just to listen to me read it. But my prayer is, is what we're about to hear from the Word of God 
will resonate in our heart and our spirit. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Look at this. Don't pursue your own interest on that day. But enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. So that lets me know that the Sabbath day is not mine. It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. So if it's the Lord's, you know, I can't, I can't just do, ah, oh, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to go and catch up on some work. I think I'm going to go and do, th-. no, no, no. Don't pursue your own interest on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it as a delight as the Lord's holy day. Look at this. Honor the Sabbath and everything you do on that day and don't follow your own desires or talk idly. It's the second time that scripture tells us don't pursue our own interest on the Sabbath. When, the Bible, when your parents said, I want to repeat myself, you knew that they meant business. When God says it twice, he means double business. He's trying to get our attention. Look at verse 14. Then, in other words, if you do this, then the Lord will be your delight and I will give you great honor and satisfy you with the inheritance I promised your ancestor Jacob. The Lord, the Lord I the Lord have spoken. So when you make time to come to corporate worship, you're setting time aside to do what is pleasing and honoring to God. And he says, if you do this, it will help you get refocused on the Lord. I don't know about you, but my week brings a lot of distractions. My my week brings a lot of things that gets my focus off God. Now I know you're not that way. You're more holy than I am. You can stay focused. But Sunday corporate worship helps me to focus, refocus on God. It's that Sabbath. It's when I come in and I worship God and I begin to worship Him and I begin to focus on Him and I begin to feel His presence. But when we make it a priority to set this time aside, it does help us refocus on God and begin to look at what His priorities are in my life. We focus on God and we begin to feel His presence. We begin to feel His power. You've possibly made this statement when we've had, when we've had a service and, and the worship is, is just, you know, it just makes you feel good. And then, and then last week, I believe, was one of those times where we came together and the worship uh, during singing was just so wonderful. And then, then we took time after the message and we spent time praying and, and then the worship team started singing again. And even Mitchell, this, this past Sunday, when we got home, he said, man, he said, prayer time was so good. Why was it so good? Because we felt the presence of God. It refocused me. And so this is what corporate worship helps me with. When I'm connected to the church and I attend and I'm able to come together with my brothers and sisters that's in my family, it helps me feel God's presence. And then the result of that, verse 14, the Bible says, and the Lord will be your delight. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty good. David said it like this in Psalm 34, 3. Glorify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Not separately, not by myself, but let's come together and let's exalt his name together. Jesus even said it like this, Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered together as my followers, my family, look at this, I am there among them. He doesn't say I'll show up later. He's already there. He's already there. He didn't say, I'll be there. He's already there. This is a very special presence of God because we know that God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He sees everything. He knows everything. He is everywhere. But when we come together with the intentions of worshiping him and placing our focus on him, he says, you know what? I'm already there, and this is a special moment. You've got my attention. You've got my attention. And and actually, this presence that Jesus is talking about, that he will be there, it it goes back even to the Old Testament, and it's what is called the Shekinah glory of God. The Shekinah glory of God. It was the presence that was in the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament that only the high priest could go behind the veil and present the uh, atonement for the sins of Israel. And when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that that veil that that separated the presence of God from, from men, that that veil was torn from top to bottom. And today, you and I don't have to have someone go behind a curtain or go to God for ourselves. But when we come together and we begin worshiping Him, in spirit and truth, guess what? We feel God's presence. 
It's that specialness. God manifests his presence in a very special way when we come together. Psalm 5 and 7 says, because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house and I will worship at your temple with the deepest awe. The deepest awe. Have you ever been in a service where you were just in the presence of God or something took place in the service, worship service, and you're just like, wow. Wow. It's happened here. Let me take a quick poll. You're here this morning, or even watching online, and someone, it may have been me, it may have been a guest speaker, it may have been a song, it may have been something that was said, and you said, you know what, how did they know that about me? Just raise your hand. Look at this. Guess what? They didn't know that about you. That wouldn't take place if you were at home with some worship music. I'm not saying you can't feel God's presence by yourself, but there's something special that takes place when the family of God comes into the house of God and experiences the presence of God. Sometimes I'm overwhelmed by his presence. I can feel his presence now. The Holy Spirit's speaking to some of you because you've gotten out of focus about being connected to the church. We fit it in if it fits our schedule. I, I want to encourage you. It's important for us to come together. It's important for us. Justin, I shared your story. Yeah, bro, could you stand up? Yes. This is a baseball playing machine. Two Sundays ago, I was, I was at that door, no, that door, and they came in, right? He, he had his baseball uniform on, and I gave him a high five. I said, man, you look sharp. And Justin looked at me and he said, he's got a game at 1230, but I told him we're going to church first. That's priority. That's teaching the next generation, yeah. There's times that we may have to be out of town for a game, but even then, we're going to fit it in. The game doesn't start till 1230, you're wearing your uniform to church. I remember several times, Ashlyn playing softball on travel team. She sat in the back of the church in the other building, and she was in church, and she was waiting for one of her teammates to come and pick her up be playing in Bentonville or Rogers. You know the traffic between here and there. The game would start at one and said, you're going to church first. Friend, I'm telling you, we need, to te- we need to make it a priority to be part of corporate worship. Not just to check the box, but so that we can feel his presence. Second of all, connecting to the church helps me face my problems with confidence. Someone said, you're either in a problem right now or you just came out of a problem, you're getting ready to go into a major problem. That'll help you be encouraged. But it's true. Sometimes life just seems like a series of problems. And I know that there are friends that'll help you, but I'm telling you, there's nothing like being connected to the family of God when you're facing major issues in your life. You see, life when it becomes like a series of problems and challenges as a result, we get discouraged, we get tired, we get fatigued, we get drained, and even sometimes depressed. But that's when we come in and we are connected to a church. And God never meant for us to go through life by ourselves. I know that when the pandemic hit, everybody came out and they were doing hashtag better together. God had that hashtag way before we came up with it. It is not good for man to live alone, be alone. We are designed for fellowship. We were designed and created for relationship. In fact, he wants you to have a church family for support. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. I love how the message puts it. So speak encouraging words to one another. Build up hope so you'll be all together in this. No one left out. No one left behind. I know you're already doing this. Just keep doing it. Speak encouraging words. Build hope in each other. 
Do that right now. 10 seconds. I want you to speak encouraging words to each other. All right, here's the application. And you say, well, I don't know what to say. Just look at them and, and say, you know what? Your teeth are awfully white this morning. Just an encouraging word. Speak that encouraging word. When we connect to the church, someone could say something that's going to encourage you. And, and, and we've been instructed to encourage others and build others up in hope. I like what Larry Crabb made this statement about connecting with other people, Christians. It says, when two people connect, when their beings intersect, something is poured out of one and into the other that has the power to heal the soul of its deepest wounds and restore it to health. People experience the life-changing force of healing relationships when something powerful comes out of one and touches, touches something good in another. We are better together. And that's what the local church does. It helps me to face my problems with confidence. Yes, I have God on my side. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I, we can quote scripture all day long, but sometimes you are standing on scripture, but you need someone just come along in the church family and say, you know what, I'm with you here. You're not alone. I know you're praying. I know God's with you. But if you need anything, you let me know. I'm praying for you. I'm here for you. If you need an ear, you can trust me. I won't say anything. And so it helps me face my problems. And so, um, and it happens here at the assembly. That's why we have, that's why we, we do what we do. That's why we have the ministries that we have. We have life groups. We have mentoring classes. We have, you know, uh, uh, opportunities on Wednesday nights in our prayer service for people to share and, and pray with one another and encourage one another. All these things that we do as ministry at the assembly is not on accident and on trial basis. It's looking at it and say, how can we connect? people so that they can be encouraged by somebody else and so it happens even in our children and our youth it happens in the lobby when you buy a cup of java from cafe for a cause and and when you buy it it supports missions but then you sit down at a table and you begin to connect with people and build relationships and probably probably out in that lobby someone has encouraged you when you've been going through a difficult time you can't get that by staying away from church. We need each other. We can't make it alone. Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. How many believe Jesus is closer today coming back than he was 10 years ago? How many knows that it's sooner, the way everything's going, everybody needs a little bit of word of encouragement. So we come together to worship, but we also come together to build relationships so that we can encourage one another. Romans 12, 4 and 5, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. So encourage each other. Relationships are important to us. They're important to us. Thirdly, connecting to the church helps me flourish in my spiritual growth. It helps me to grow into spiritual maturity. We're not just a social club that hangs out with friends and hears some good music and a good speech. No, we do what we do so that we can grow on our spiritual journey. I look at it as a highway. When you merge onto a highway and you start on one end of the state, it's a mile marker. Mile marker one. Mile marker two, mile marker three, and it goes all the way across the state. Some of us just began this journey, and you may be on mile marker one, or you may be on mile marker 10, but there's someone that's already taken that journey, and they're at mile marker 25 or, or 50 or 75, and they can help you on your journey to know where construction will be delaying you or where the potholes are in the highway. We're all in this together. It's growing, it's spiritual maturity taking place. Hebrews 6, verse 1 in the Living Bible, let us go on and become mature in our understanding as strong Christians ought to be. May we go on and become mature in our understanding as strong Christians ought to be. You need to continue to grow and mature as believers in Christ. We want to fill you with love and knowledge, most definitely. And we love you. We just don't, we love you too much to let you stay the way you are. 
And so we want to help you on your spiritual journey. And that's what the church helps us do. We have all different types of tools. Right now, media, you can, it's free for you. You can download it off our app. And you can be discipled in that way, in between services. Like I said, life groups, mentoring groups. We had the fire class. We're going to crank back up next year. And we have, we have, I mean, there's so many different ways that you can grow on your spiritual journey because you're connected to the local church. And it helps because how many of you have ever had a question about life? I have. I have. And people have questions like this. How can I learn to forgive those who have hurt me? Well, sometimes you can't do that on your own. You have to learn how to do that. And you learn by the word of God, but then you can also learn by someone who has gone through what you've been through. People ask, how can I know what job I should have? What career? What profession? Once again, the Bible can speak to that, but also the relationships you build with other Christians and in in, in Christ's family can help you with that. Who am I supposed to marry? There are people, believers, that were going to marry a certain person and somebody came to them and said, you probably don't need to marry them. You probably don't need to marry them. And they shared it with love and they shared the reasons and they stopped a tragic divorce of taking place. That's what relation, Christian relationships are all about. Because we go to the scripture. We care for one another. We love for one another. We love each other. You've been through experiences that I've never been through. But if I go through them, I can come to you and say, hey, can you help me out? And the same for me. We're a family. We're a family. People say, you know, I'm divorced. Should I get married again? There are people in this room that have traveled that path. And you build relationships with them. How can I overcome self-destructive behavior? There are people in this room that have gone through that. I'm dealing with gender identity. How can I handle that? We need to sit down and have these conversations with Scripture as our foundation. We can't ignore what's taking place in our culture. We can't ignore what's taking place in our church. But when we have true, open relationships with each other and a biblical foundation, we can speak truth and love and say, listen, you're part of my family, and I refuse for you to make that kind of decision that can destroy your future. So connecting to a church helps me with my spiritual growth. And then fourthly, connecting to church helps me find and fulfill my purpose in the kingdom. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, and we're going to close. So what do I mean by that? That that being connected to a church helps me find and fulfill my purpose in the kingdom. Listen, if you're breathing, God's not finished with you here on earth. You still have a purpose. He still has a plan for your life. We're not put on earth just to take up space. We're not here on earth just to take up space and breathe the air that we breathe. God expects you to give something back. He expects me to give something back. And it's been through the church on my spiritual journey that I have found not just the gift of teaching and preaching, communicating. God has given me that gift. And I I don't say that in an egotistical, prideful way. Because God won't... He can, but he sees what other people may not see in you, and he has wired you for a certain, certain ministry with a certain gift. Many of you are gifted in a lot of different ministries and areas that I'm not as gifted in, and he wants you to rise to the occasion, find and fulfill the purpose that he has for your life. He expects you to use your gift to, to help other people. He's given you abilities. He's given you talents. He's given, he's given you gifts, and he expects you to be a good steward of those to help the body of Christ. One day you're going to stand before God. And he's basically, in 21st century vernacular, is going, he's going to ask each and every one of us, what'd you do with what I gave to you? What'd you do with what I gave to you? Did you use it? Or did you not? And we're going to be held accountable for that. Ephesians 2 and 10 says, For we are God's masterpiece 
He has created us as a new in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We are his masterpiece. In fact, the Greek word used here for masterpiece is the same word we get our word poem from. And so you're a work of art. <laughs> I'm a work of art. We are a masterpiece made by God. And he has something for you to do. So the church helps us find and fulfill the purpose God has for my life. The Bible says he designed you, regardless of the circumstances of how you got here on earth, God has a purpose for every believer in Jesus Christ. And he says, I want you to make your life count. I want you to know it's not our job, it's our job as a church, and we do this. We help people discover their spiritual gift, their, their personality wiring. I'm, I'm really more more interested in how God has wired you for ministry than he's wired you for personality. And, and because that's what we need to do. We need to be involved in ministry. God has given me gifts to help build the church up, help to grow the kingdom of God. And when I find that spiritual gift, I need to put it to good use. In fact, scripture even supports this. As pastors, as teachers, it is my job to help you discover that. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds, or pastors, that's the, uh, the original wording is pastors in the Greek, and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. Not the ministry, just for ministry. That's what we are to do as a church leadership. We are to come alongside and help equip every believer in this church to come alongside and say, okay, we want to help equip you to do the work of ministry that God has intended for you to fulfill. And so Life Track is how we do that. It's just the beginning. And we believe in this from the youngest to the oldest. We believe that God has placed you here for a reason, not just in this church, but here on earth to make a difference. So the church helps you when, when you're connected to the church to to fulfill and find that purpose that God has for you. 1 Corinthians 12, 5 says there are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. Skip down to verse 27. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is part of it. Part of it. You're part of the family of God. You're part of the family of God, and I want you to know that you're important to the family of God. Would you stand this morning? There's five great needs for every human personality. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's just basic needs. You need a purpose to live for, significance. You need people to live with and around and do life with that support. You need principles to live by that gives you stability. You need a power to live on. It's the stimulation that comes as we come and we gather together in worship. And you need a profession to live out, and that is self-expression. This is not a Christian study. But all across the board, every study that's been done shares that every human being has these five needs. Isn't it interesting that a secular study shares with us the five basic needs of the human personality and God has set up the church to fulfill all five. I don't think it's coincidence. God created us. He knows what we need. And he's designed the church, the church family, to fulfill every one of those needs. So this is what I want us to do this morning. Our prayer team's gonna come. We're gonna close out like we do Every, every week. And first of all, I want the Holy Spirit to speak to you because maybe you're here today, maybe you're watching online and, and you're just not part of the church family. Now, I'm not saying the assembly family. I'm just talking about you, you, you're not following Christ. You're making decisions that are not pleasing to God. That's the first step. Going back to our verse of Scripture found in 1 Peter 
It says he has created us and he has died for us. And, and we talked about so that we could have the privilege of being part of his family. And my number one priority that is this, if you are not part of the family of God, that's your first step. And we wanna welcome you to take that first step. And so prayer partners, would you mind to come? Just begin to spread out across the front. We do this each and every week for the most part is we take time to pray. Maybe you need to, maybe you've got some decisions to make. Maybe you need prayer for physical healing. Maybe you need wisdom, whatever the prayer. We believe that God answers prayer. But especially if you're struggling in this discipline of being connected to the church, maybe you want to find your purpose. We want you to come. We want to pray with you. We want to guide you through that, through that process. Whatever it is, whatever it is, we want to take this time to respond to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us after hearing the Word of God. So close your eyes if you don't mind. I'm going to pray. Worship team's going to begin to sing, and I want you to make your move to the front to be prayed for. Father, we ask Holy Spirit that you speak to us. What are you trying to teach us today? How can we live fit by being disciplined and being connected to the church? Is the church perfect? No way. But you are. And so this morning, may we respond according to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you step out right now? And we're going to take just some time for ministry through prayer. And then I'll come back and we'll close out here in just a little bit. But will you come? We want to pray with you in ministry. Again, thank you so much for joining us online at the Assembly. We hope this message encouraged you and we would love to stay connected. So be sure to click the link below and contact us and join us this Sunday. We can't wait to see you.